and I want to officially welcome everybody to our camp webinar. It's Monday, March the 8th, 2021. And this evening we have Danielle Downey and she is the executive director of Project Apis M and has been working with honeybees and the parasites that plague them, unfortunately, for over 25 years. She brings a wealth of experience. Her background includes training and research from bee labs in Minnesota, Canada, and en France aussi. Oh, uh, beekeeper education, working with commercial beekeepers and queen breeders, regulatory work as a state apiarist in Utah and Hawaii, and the cool factor of wrangling bees for TV, right? How fun is that? <laughs> oh, man. So she's worked closely with the Apiary Inspectors of America, the Bee Inform pro uh, Project, and uh, Bee Breeding Project with collaborators in Hawaii, Louisiana, and Europe selecting and refining varroa resistant bees. It's something everybody wants. So she holds a BSc from the University of Minnesota and an MSc from Simon Fraser University in Canada. So I would like us to warmly welcome Danielle to share all of her knowledge that she has about varroa resistant bees. And uh, you are a co-host, Danielle, so I invite you to share okay. your, your screen. Thank you. All right. So, um, Wendy, uh, it's, if there's a pressing question that comes up in the chat that is worth stopping me, I'm happy to answer it as we go. Okay. Uh, and I probably have too much information on my slides, so I hope it won't stress anyone out if I watch the time and and uh, zoom through a few because you know how it is when we have so many slide decks to pick from. Sometimes it's hard to gauge how long it will take. And I'm going to say right now that my organization is something that I think all beekeepers should be aware of. So I'm going to spend a little, little bit of the front end telling you what Project Apis M is and what we do. Um, and then I'll transition after some of that background into talking about the breeding project. All right. Oh, let's see. So Project Apis M, as you all know, is Apis mellifera, the Western honeybee. And our nonprofit is um, geared towards honeybee health. So we, we get funding from beekeepers and bee clubs. And in fact, our organization was founded in 2006 with funding from beekeepers and growers of almonds, primarily, who felt like research wasn't really serving their needs. They wanted applied questions answered for their bottom line. Back around then, the sky was falling with colony collapse disorder. And so they each put in a buck a hive, whether they kept bees or they rented bees for pollination to support research projects that were selected by our nonprofit um, to benefit what they needed done. So Project Apis M since that time has been able to leverage all that um, confidence and the donated money from beekeepers and growers to solicit corporate funding. As you know, the interest in bees isn't going away. In fact, it's growing and corporations and consumers and the general public really wanted help. And so our organization is a vehicle for um, high impact projects with uh, connections to beekeepers and pollinated crops. We also apply for grants, but the, the point that I wanna make about this nonprofit is it's focused on honeybees and it was beekeepers and growers that developed it. Since our formation, we have put a lot of money into research and also forage projects. And here you can see the diversity of funding that we have. So we get money from a variety of sources and then put that into projects based on what the donor wants, based on what the beekeepers need. 
um, to have the most impact. So there's a few of us that work for the nonprofit. Uh, this is the staff. You may be familiar with Billy Sink. He lives in Sacramento and he uh, manages the Seeds for Bees forage program. But what really keeps us true to our mission is the cadre of volunteers that support it. And these are research scientists who many of you are probably familiar with from beekeeping meetings. They're some of the scientists doing relevant applied research and they volunteer their time to help us read all of the proposals and make sure that they're the best um, science methods and relevance for um, the proposals that we get. And we also have a board of very influential, successful commercial beekeepers primarily. And it's this board that um, has stewarded Project APSM through a lot of interesting uh, years in beekeeping. And just to demonstrate the board's influence, together combined, they have over 85,000 colonies of bees. They produce over 5 million pounds of honey and pack over 70 million pounds of honey. They pollinate more than 32 crops on contract, and that includes 75,000 acres of almonds. They're leaders in state and national organizations. Combined, they have over 28 generations of beekeepers, and um, they actually incubate research projects. So as a researcher wants to do applied research, often they don't have the hundreds or thousands of colonies that you would like to see to have a field relevant research project. And so the board members often allow those researchers to come and, and use their colonies to do their projects. So that's a true believer because research definitely takes a toll on colonies. Going through them isn't standard management. So um, these guys really do a lot for the organization and for progress in bee health research. As many of you know, um, the, there's a lot of sensation about what's killing bees and is it a mystery? Is it cell phones? Is it the rapture? There's been a lot of interesting ideas, but as beekeepers, we know it's not a mystery what's killing bees. In fact, there are some very clear culprits. One is the varroa mites, and we know that varroa will kill colonies if it's not treated. Um, and the varroa mite acts almost like a dirty needle and vectors viruses that also kill the colonies. Pesticides are a big concern. Um, as agriculture grows, so does crop pest control. And of course, nobody wants to kill bees, but there's a lot more exposure as those bees are around agriculture. And also poor nutrition. So we call these the four Ps. Poor nutrition encapsulates things like urbanization, um, like monocultures that, that are decreasing the diversity in agriculture and just less bee pasture. So the, the landscape doesn't support as many bees with good nutrition the way that it used to. So this is a big stressor for bees. So PAM has funded over 120 research projects and you can see here how they break down. I encourage you to go to our website if you're curious about seeing what kinds of projects we fund or finding details about any specific project. Um, we also have a portal where you can apply for funding. Um, and I, I encourage beekeepers to, if you know any of our research advisors or our board members, if you ever have a suggestion, please, we, we, we're here to help beekeepers with what their um, concerns are. And if you have ideas or suggestions, we love to hear it. So what's new each year at PAM? This year, we've funded 29 new research projects. We've grown many thousands of acres in our forage programs, one in California and also one in the upper Midwest. Uh, and we also do things that kind of fit a niche that isn't necessarily research like this indoor storage guide. So we know that um, beekeepers are looking more at indoor storage. And so we developed a resource that aggregates all of the knowledge of the state of that science because it's hard to find and, and it's growing quickly and it's expensive. And so if we can find that expertise amongst professional beekeepers and researchers and consolidate it into a guide so that if you're thinking about using indoor storage for your colonies, 
here's the things to watch out for and things to think about in one resource. That's on our, our website. We also offer a lot of graduate student scholarships, which allows um, research to be done uh, quickly and affordably. Um, and we have a Bee Health Collective website, which is a, a clearinghouse for a lot of opportunities. If you're looking for a job in bee research or beekeeping, um, or if you're looking for funding, the Bee Health Collective website has resources that you can check out for that. Okay, so now I'm gonna give you just, you know, there's too much research to tell you about all of it. Um, and I would be happy to talk to you about specifics on a project, but it won't all fit in one talk. So I decided to just pick a few projects to give you a taste for what kind of things that PAM funds. So this first one is for varroa control. We know that these organic acids like oxalic acid and formic acid, they're pretty cheap, they're pretty effective. Um, at killing mites and they can be certified organic because they're a natural product that is out there in honey um, often anyway. So they can be used uh, more versatile than some of the other synthetic compounds. The problem is they're hard to use. Uh, they're hard to predict in some of the forms that we apply them, they're pretty toxic. So here you see me in a respirator with all the gloves and gear. And so we're working with a chemist to develop a polymer of oxalic and formic acid so that it will be released slower, more predictably, and be a, a dual action mite control uh, in a new product. You are probably all familiar with chalk root in your colonies. It's a fungus that grows through the larvae and when it's um, reproducing, it turns black like this one and has spores. And when the bees clean out, this is called a mummy and it used to be a bee larvae. When the bees clean that out, they get spores on them and then they feed it to the larvae that are developing and they spread the disease. And we know that bacteria and fungus naturally compete. And so, you know, this is how penicillin was discovered. And so there's a project to say, well, if we can give the right bacteria to bees, might it suppress this fungal problem? Uh, beekeepers spend a lot of money on supplemental feeds, especially when we're trying to manage them towards pollinating so early in the year, uh, bo boosting colonies and getting them ready for that Herculean task requires a lot of inputs at unnatural times of the year. And so beekeepers wonder which, what's the best supplement, which one is the best value, are the bees eating it or, or just hauling it out. And so we have funded a project to do side-by-side -side comparisons of um, these pollen substitutes in a commercial operation to show the economic analysis of how the bees do with a variety of these products. Uh, another, uh, I know that master beekeepers are, are learning all of the cool things about the natural tendencies of honeybees. And here we see a bee collecting propolis from a tender bud um, of, a, of a tree and they use it to stick things together to seal up holes. They also use it to varnish and create an envelope in the natural cavity that they nest in in a tree. So here we see a cottonwood tree that's been varnished with propolis. And this was in uh, Moab, Utah. And in February, you can see this same hole in the cottonwood tree. And the bees have built a curtain of propolis to close the door because it's cold. And this same hole you can see in May when it's warming up that they're chewing back that curtain. So I just love that. I think it's really a, a cool photo series to show just how bees do what they do. But it's also understood that bees are probably using the antiviral and antibacterial properties of the propolis as medicine for themselves. And so studying, uh, you know, beekeepers have selected against bees that collect propolis and we're starting to wonder, maybe that's not so wise. Maybe the bees need this and we need to find a way to work with this tendency to see some benefits. So this is a project to understand, does propolis promote higher survival 
in bees? Does propolis trap pesticide chemistry um, in, its, in some of its bioactivity? Um, so it, looking to, for ways that we can improve management and also have healthier bees with propolis is this project with the, the Baton Rouge Bee Lab. The main um, mite control compound that commercial beekeepers rely on right now is Amitraz. We've been using it for, gosh, 12 years or so. And we know that we're in the range where most miticides fail because the mites develop resistance. And so beekeepers are watching this very closely and nervously to, to make sure that it's still working because once it stops working, there's gonna be a crisis in mite management. So we've funded several projects, three of them um, in the last year to develop an assay that beekeepers can use to be sure that their amitraz treatments are working and surveying populations where beekeepers say it isn't working. So sending the scientists there to figure out um, if in fact this is a, a verified resistance um, and document it and also working with a geneticist to understand the genes that confer resistance in the varroa mites and having a genetic test and genetic markers in addition to these field assays. Uh, I think this is the last research project I'm going to describe. Um, we know that conservation, especially as the amount of forage to support bees is becoming more and more scarce. Honeybees and native bees like bumblebees and leafcutter bees are overlapping at the, at the resource and people are concerned about this. Are there diseases being passed back and forth? Are they out competing um, the, the species that are more, uh, that are less resilient and less competitive? How can we share resources? And of course, Pam likes to build a big umbrella and the forage, you know, if we put more forage, it has indiscriminate value to many species. Uh, but still, there's a lot of science that we need in order to argue that honeybees have a place and that honeybees aren't killing off all of the other bees, hopefully. Um, and, and so the best way to to make that argument is we believe data. So we have a, a lab in Logan that is a honeybee lab, but also has, well, they do honeybee work, but they also do uh, solitary bee work. And so we're funding that lab to look at these other species of bees, bumblebees and leafcutter bees with and without apiaries and see, are they um, as successful does, are they competing? And if we give them supplemental forage, does it benefit all of them uh, throughout the year? So this is a really cool study that will help us understand not only how the bees are sharing resources, but also how we can help them all by supplementing the forage in an area. Uh, and, and the forage project, so research is the long game. We know that we have to do tedious, painstaking work in order to answer our scientific questions. And those are building blocks that ultimately will help us make progress. But in the short term, if we can just give bees better nutrition, it actually mitigates a lot of these other stressors. Um, like a honeybee colony, if you can get through that round of brood that has been compromised by pesticides or by disease and get to some a new cohort of bees, the colony can carry itself through that attrition and succeed. And what it takes to do that is good healthy forage, which is just planting flowers. So this is a solution that we have implemented in California because we know we can reach a lot of bees there during almonds and also in the upper Midwest, because we know that many, almost three quarters of the bees um, in their summer range are moved into these states to go and fetch uh, a honey surplus crop. So we have the Seeds for Bees program in California and the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund in the upper Midwest. So you may have seen some of these almond orchards with the mustard mixes around them. This is the Seeds for Bees program and we give growers free seed and help them 
get over the barrier of having to buy it. We also give them assistance to get, to advise them how to plant it and have success. And you know that when pollen comes into a hive, it stimulates that hive to lay more eggs and produce more brood. And that brood actually then feeds the foragers um, signals to go out and get more pollen because they need protein to feed the brood. So by giving the bees more forage, as soon as they're placed in staging areas for almonds, you're actually getting a jump start for those bees to start pollinating almonds. So this is a win-win for the beekeeper and the grower. And preliminary results from Alina Nino show that when bees have access to these cover crops, they average three frames more when they come out of almonds, which is three frames is a lot for a, a difference in colony strength. And this graph just shows how much we're growing each year. We're increasing this acreage. And we really hope to see the general concept of an almond orchard include also blooming cover crops. Uh, this is the indoor storage guide that I described before. So I encourage you to, it's a PDF that you can download on Pam's website for free. It's like 30 pages or you can, um, so you can print it or look at it and learn the state of the science for indoor storage of bees. And I'm going to pause there for a second and ask Wendy, are there any questions before I transition to the breeding program? No, I think you're good to go. Talk about the breeding program. Thank you. Great. Okay. So uh, Hilo bees are the, this is the project of breeding varroa resistant bees in Hilo, Hawaii. And the mission is to develop a bee that has good varroa resistance but also with traits suitable for commercial beekeepers. And we wanna have them at a commercial scale. So this is a video um, that shows kind of the Eureka behavior that was discovered where honeybees, some of them have this trait where they can sense that the varroa mite has crawled into a developing bee cell right before it's capped and the varroa mite feeds on that larvae and lays eggs and reproduces. And then the foundress and her progeny crawl out. But the varroa sensitive bees know that the mite is trying to reproduce in there. And so they uncap it and together they chew out this larvae. And they, you know, they recycle parts of it, but some of the, the brood is chewed out and lost and sacrificed. But the more important thing is that this varroa mite has lost her chance to reproduce. We don't really know how they do this, uh, like what the cues are. We are. There's a lot of work to understand that. But the idea is that with high levels of this behavior, the reproductive mites are gone. So even if they don't kill the mite, they interrupt its reproduction and the varroa mites are kept very low. The bees don't seem to remove non-reproductive mites. So there's something about a reproductive mite that cues this behavior. And if you can get this behavior at a very high reliable level, you'll have bees that can help themselves and don't require treatment against varroa mite. And in fact, the research labs where they've discovered this, they don't treat for varroa and they have you know, many hundreds of colonies that have not been treated for over a decade. So you've probably heard of the SMR, which is suppressed mite reproduction, which then became called VSH honeybees. And I wanna give you some context because these ideas and these bees have been around for a long time. And when I talk about it, people say, well, haven't we already heard about this? And yes and no is the answer. So the first phase was when they discovered this trait and it really was a eureka moment, they were very, excited and they inbred it. They, they didn't want to lose the trait in that bee population. They didn't understand it very well, but once they figured out what they had, they selected that trait and they had very high mite resistance, but it didn't have the other traits that are absolutely necessary for commercial beekeepers, like big brood nests, like good honey crops. Um, and so the second phase of of refining these bees was the Pauline honeybee. And this was the, 
VSHB given to commercial beekeepers and run through their operations and outcrossed in those operations. Um, and then finding the ones on the end of that year that had low mite levels were also very productive um, and using those to breed the next generation. So basically trying to get the best traits of bees in addition to that mite resistance. And those were the Pauline honeybees. And that was a fairly successful step, but there still wasn't very good adoption. Um, and, and there was nobody making these bees available on a scale that beekeepers could try it and, and see if they liked it. Um, I may come back to this. So here's a timeline that shows, basically it was the, the Baton Rouge Bee Lab, the ARS lab, where they discovered this and inbred it and then worked on Pauline. And the phase three that we're picking up is in Hawaii on the bottom of this line. And if you wanna take more time to read about this, I encourage you to look at the Hilo Bees website because this is on there with a lot more detail and explanation if you're interested. But these are some of the partners. So drawing from that expertise of where this trait was discovered and developed and studied, we have Bob Danka and John Harbo, um, Jeff Harris. These are the scientists that worked on it in the first two phases. Um, this is a European guy that is studying this in populations in Europe. Uh, and this is the beekeeper in Hawaii who is incubating the project in Hilo. And so this is a public-private partnership uh, with research scientists and also beekeepers who are incubating the project. And of course, Project ABSM. So phase three of breeding the better bees is to stabilize this mite resistance um, and make sure that it is absolutely what we need it to be. And then scale this up so that we can deliver commercial quantities. You've probably all heard about somebody's favorite bee and it just because it works for um, a small beekeeper, I mean, that's great for them, but it doesn't really offer anything to the bigger picture. If we wanna impact um, a large amount of, of beekeeping and, and make it sustainable, we have to have many, many, many tens of thousands of queens available in order for commercial beekeepers to adopt it and try it. And then eventually all of us can reduce our mite treatments because we've produced enough of these bees to be adopted by these larger operations. So this began in Hilo um, in actually 2015 and 2016. So to give you some context of where it's happening, this is the big island of Hawaii. Um, the state is called Hawaii, but this island is also called Hawaii. And Kona is on the east or west side of the island. Sorry. Yes, uh, west side of the island. And Kona is where the probably the largest commercial queen producer in the whole world is producing queens. And this is the uh, dry side and this is the rainy side. So Hilo's on the other side of the island. The conditions are not as ideal as on the dry side for queen mating, but there's still plenty of nice days and um, we have had great success to scale up and, and breed bees on this side of the island. In addition to the benefit of having relative isolation um, at the beekeeper that incubates this is by far the largest beekeeper on this side of the island. So, this island already allows year-round queen rearing. And so the big island of Hawaii pro provides enough queens that we figure it's 25% of the queens used on the mainland US and 75% of the queens used in Canada. So this is a really great place to do a breeding project and to, and to not be interrupted by seasonality in your breeding testing and progress. So it takes a lot to, to attempt this effort. Um, the scientific rigor of testing that varroa resistance behavior requires that you open up 
brood cells and look and say, how many Varroa do we find and how many of them are reproductive? Um, and if you do that at the right timing where the behavior should have already happened and we know all of these things, um, you, you know, to test one colony, you end up opening up hundreds of cells to look for Varroa uh, and measure, is it in fact, uh, is this colony exhibiting a high level of this resistance trait? So you need a technical staff, we have a laboratory there, and of course you need a lot of colonies. So you need um, colonies that have been instrumentally inseminated with crosses that you choose in order to test for mite resistance. So by, by choosing the queen that tests well and using drones from a colony that also tested well and instrumentally inseminating them, we're reducing a lot of that background noise. So this is, uh, a breeding project that happens very intentionally with, with inseminated crosses. We also need field performance colonies that are full size because you can't judge the brood nest and the honey production of a nuke. And you wouldn't necessarily want to use an inseminated queen to judge those things anyway. So you have open mated queens. Um, and to do that, you need drone source colonies colonies in isolated areas. So producing production colonies still requires that you tr really enrich that trait in both the grafting source and the drones that are mating with those queens in isolated and or flooded areas with these colonies. So having a commercial beekeeper that has 6,000 colonies uh, on that side of the island is really the only way that you could hope to have that kind of genetic enrichment in your breeding program. And uh, actually all of his production colonies have been turned over to these genes now. So um, it's not just that he has some colonies with these VSHBs, he's transitioned everything to these colonies. So this is probably the largest operation in the world that's completely populated with resistant stock. So by the numbers, just to, to give you an idea of the scale, here's, here we see instrumental insemination, and here we see looking down into a cell to see how many progeny um, that Varroa mite has reproduced. And so there's microscopes and um, a lot of equipment for instru instrumental insemination. And over the years, we've had to inseminate uh, this isn't even up to date, but thousands of queens, um, the drone colonies that we test and keep data on are numbering also in the thousands, uh, opening the brood cells and counting how much varroa reproduction, that's a, at a smaller number. Uh, we're doing that only with potential breeders um, and that's hundreds. And sampling just like you do, uh, shaking bees to count the number of mites on adult bees, many, many thousands of, of counts happen there. So it's a lot of work. But the real value and the real information that is going to convince us is getting the queens that we produce there into field trials in commercial operations. And so we have had ongoing field trials and this year it was in five states where we have side-by-side -side Hilo, Hilo queens with commercially available um, non-selected queens. And we install them into equalized splits after almonds and follow them for a whole year. Four times a year, we come and measure the mite levels. We count the frames of bees, we count the frames of brood. We also assess nosema and viruses. Um, and over time, of course, we want to verify that queen is the, the marked clipped queen because they all have to be the original queens. And did the queen survive and did the colony survive? In the fall, we measure the honey that they produced. And uh, also in the spring, did they make pollination grade? I see a few questions. Is there anything I should answer now, Wendy? Uh, we had a question about uh, how do you discern between a fertile and non-fertile mite? Um, well, we don't really know if the mite is fertile or not, but basically we look to see if she laid eggs. Mm -hmm. 
So a lot of times they crawl in there and they don't lay eggs and then it's an easy like non-productive mite. Sometimes they crawl in there and they lay eggs, but in the, t the, the, the varroa has to make it to a certain um, stage in order to be viable. So you look in there and you may see reproduction, but you can tell, well, that mite will never make it because that bee is going to emerge in three days. And so that would be a mite that tried to reproduce, but was going to fail. Um, so that would be a non-viable. So I think that um, that's probably more technical than you mean, but basically we you open the cell and if the varroa has progeny or not, it's pretty obvious. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. So this, now I'm gonna get into some of the more, um, you know, mind boggling data and, We've been doing this now for four years. We're in and and in multiple states, so we have a lot of graphs of data in different states, and so it's it's hard to compare. So I'm going to give you the generalized things that we believe that we see consistently enough that I have data to support all of this, rather than showing you everything and making you make sense of it. I'm just going to kind of focus in on the the things that we see consistently. So here, um, this is me in a commercial operation in South Dakota. And this, these three graphs that I have stacked up here are mites per 100 bees in August um, in South Dakota, Louisiana, and North Dakota. So side-by-side -side field trials. And you can see that the unselected bees are all over threshold which is three mites per 100 bees on average. Um, and the helo bees are all below threshold at the same time. So that's a very uh, a simple picture. But my point is that we really feel like we have enriched this trait to a high degree. Um, here's pictures of how it looks in the North Dakota trials when we're assessing colonies and measuring honey production of each colony. And again, this is a, a generalized graph of how we manage these and what we saw. So in May, all of the equalized splits have very low varroa because they've all been treated. In August, that's the graphs that I was showing you in the last slide. The helo bees are below threshold and the commercial Italians are, are above threshold. And so typically in the operations, the beekeepers would treat um, after pulling honey, they would apply a treatment, but only to the Italians. So the helo bees never got treated. And then in October, this is a period when there's uh, very little brood. And so we're seeing high levels because the mites are mostly phoretic and the helo bee mite levels go up, but then in, and this is without treatment in February, the helo bee levels and the Italians are about the same, but the yellow ones have been treated. Okay, so now here's the here's the the big lineup of punches of data. So uh, we compared the queen losses of both types of bees, and they were not different. They're about thirty percent for both bee types from May to August. So so um, we weren't able to put the final data in because it's being gathered right now in almonds for the the field trial that's happening this year. So no difference in the um, original queen's survival. And this doesn't mean the colonies that turned over died. It just means that the queen superseded or something went wrong and it was equal, whether it was a helo bee or a control bee. In August, the Italian colonies had more frames of bees than helo colonies. So 15.1 versus 13.4 frames of bees. Honey production was higher in Italian colonies. So 69 versus 46 pounds per colony. We have yet to test this in a year that's a really good honey year in, um, in the locations that we've used. So this is a concern um, for beekeepers that rely heavily on pollen, or sorry, on honey production. We have had several beekeepers say to us, 
I would gladly trade some honey for mite resistance. Um, and also when you look at this second data, if the Italian colonies have more bees in August than Hilo, this is probably gonna account for more honey production because the field force is larger. And interestingly, the Hilo colonies that were bigger did produce more honey. So we're not convinced that this reduced honey production is um, necessary. We think that we can probably select the Hilo bees to improve honey production given more time. You know, the bees that we work with now have been selected for hundreds of years for honey production. So we shouldn't be too surprised that the ones that, you know, we're trying to select this new bee and the honey production um, may need some improvement and that's going to take time. Uh, after the honey was pulled, the varroa infestations of the Italian bees were 3.4 times greater than the Hilo bees. So that's 4.8 versus 1.4 mites per 100 bees after the honey was pulled. In October, the Italian colonies continued to have more mites even though they were treated than the untreated Hilo colonies. So this is an interesting trait where the bees that get treated, the mites rebounded even higher um, and we don't really know what that explanation is, but the beekeepers thought that, that act, they didn't actually think that was a surprise. So uh, an interesting trait. And the Italian colonies also at this point had smaller populations. And this is probably because the mites have taken a toll. The mite levels are higher and um, so those colonies, even though they were treated, the mites took a toll and caused smaller populations. And they also had lower survival. So the Italian queens had lower survival than the Hilo queens, 53 versus 38%. What was left had similar numbers of frames of bees. And what was left in February had similar mite levels, keeping in mind that one group was treated and the other was not for Varroa. So that's all the data that I wanted to show you. That was a lot. But in summary, we've had several years of selection and breeding and we have successfully scaled up. In this last year, we produced 30,000 queens to share with about 20 commercial beekeepers for their feedback. And this is more of an informal um, distributing 100 queens in a batch to a beekeeper who's willing to, to meet with us a few times a year um, by survey and give us their feedback about these queens. That is separate from these field trials that have been much more formal and capturing data in five states. So we are not only getting that data, but getting the beekeepers feeling for how the bees are in their own managements. Uh, we also launched a website, which is helobees.com, and it has a lot of this information. It has FAQ, so if you're curious about something, it's probably on there. It also has a web form. If you'd like to request some of these bees, you can access that through the website. And our next steps are just to continue to breed, select, and scale up. That, that will never go away. It's always going to require um, some careful selecting work in order to produce breeders year over year. This is not a dominant trait. And so you have to have it in the drones in addition to the queen in order to see the benefits. So the, the maintenance of this is an effort. You can't just graft and then have that queen mate with whoever, whatever drones are in the air because the trait is not sufficient like that. You have to enrich the drone population as well. And we'll keep developing capacity. We have some uh, partners taking some of these bees who are interested in potentially propagating them. So ultimately we hope this will be kind of an open source genetic material that we can attract some beekeepers that see the value in it and understand how to make it successful in their own breeding operations. So that's the long-term goal of where we're going with this effort. All right. That is my uh, pandemic bee. <laughs> Thank 
you. <laughs> thank uh, you. I want to say thank you for your attention and um, and for supporting Pam. Uh, you beekeepers make all this possible, and we do it for you guys. So I'd be happy to take any questions. Yeah, thank you so much for being here with us this evening. I, I certainly learned a lot. I have a question. How can California master beekeepers in 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 this state? How can we help? How uh, and and do you see this project becoming um, viable in our state, given the amount of beekeepers? Absolutely, I think. Um, one thing that makes it challenging in California is that there are so many queen producers there and it's difficult to find isolation to mate queens intentionally. Um, if, if there's drones in the air, chances are they're not your drones or, you know, they're not all your drones. Mm -hmm. So I think being aware of this, um, I think observing and keeping good notes about your own colonies, I, I'm sure that in, in your training your teaching about selection and making the hard decisions to to cull and to make more of the things intentionally that you like i mean i think often because it's a bug and it looks the same in in the queen cage we think they're the same but when you look at your colony you certainly can tell the difference of the ones that you'd like more of and the ones that you wouldn't and so getting your mind into a place of making those choices and sometimes sacrificing a colony and propagating one consciously rather than haphazardly helps us all. Um, and eventually we hope to have more queens available for smaller scale. Right now we're not set up to distribute that sm those small amounts, but we sure hope to. Um, so we're growing and I think, I think it's already been, I've been working on this project now for about 10 years. Wow. So. Wow. It's, uh, it's a long game, Wendy. It's going to take a long time. So I'm, I'm just glad that people are learning about it. And um, when it's when that when it the opportunity is there, you'll you'll have known, okay, that's what this Hilo B is, right? Tell me about the temperament. They're really nice. Um, some of those early VSHBs got a bad reputation, but uh, I work these and you, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. And of the almost 30 commercial beekeepers that we've given them to, nobody has complained about temperament at all. Not a single. That's great. Uh, if anybody here has a question, I encourage you to come on camera and unmute and ask away. I have a question, Danielle. I may have missed this, but were the Italians also via VSH? No, they were unselected. Thank and they're, they're an Italian bee that um, they actually came from Kona. So th this is just a, um, a commercially available bee that's not selected for Varroa at all. Thanks for your question, Denise. I'll pose another one. So do you have any time frame of when a hobbyist might be able to get a Hilo bee? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, you know, we've been talking about that um, very recently because some of the board members work with hobby groups uh, at Project APSM. And so we're working with our board members who understand the project and they, you know, they're the most of the ones taking a hundred at a time. And so we're wondering if we can distribute a smaller amount and, and count on those beekeepers to get feedback. We just don't have the capacity to service everybody's questions and, and input at that level. So we're, we're hiring people and hoping to get there, but it'll, you know, it'll probably be at least a year from now. Hmm. But it, it's helpful if there's organization, you know, some clubs are very organized and could take a hundred queens and uh, manage the, the survey work periodically. And, and so if we had partners that were willing to help help us do that, that would make a difference rather than us having to contact all those people. If the club itself had an infrastructure and a reliable communication network that, that we could use, that would speed things up. Um, I have another question. I'm just curious what you were uh, treating the Italians with. 
when you did oh, treat for Varroa? It was whatever the commercial guys were using. So it was Got probably it. each time. Okay. Got it. Okay. Um, so in California, uh, Towser has pr participated in a field trial. I know he's a queen producer there. Mm -hmm. And Lauren Russert has these bees in some of her research project. Yep. Um, so they're, you know, they're around. They're, they're, you know, they're getting around and people are studying them. They're nearby. And as a, as a beginner beekeeper, perhaps, if um, like it's sometimes the marketing and the spin around varroa resistant bees encourages people to think, oh, great, I'm gonna buy me some varroa resistant queens, some VSH queens, and I won't ever have to treat for varroa because I've, I've got VSH queens. Can you speak to that point a little bit? Yeah, it's pretty frustrating because we're doing so much work to to vet that the resistance is there you know opening all those brood cells is the only assay that we have we don't have genetic markers yet um there's labs working on that and that would be a really great tool if we could identify the genes and not have to open the brood cells and use a microscope to see if the varroa reproduced but you can open a bee journal and find ads in the back that offers varroa resistant bees um, and Unfortunately, and I don't mean to disparage any of those companies, but it's buyer beware. That if yeah. you, if how do you know? Not if I tell you the only way to know this is to actually look at the varroa um, reproduction. There's not many of them that do that. It's a lot of work. It takes a lot of time, and so you know, over time, if you test and you have low varroa levels and you verify that you have that same queen, you could infer that you have a varroa resistant queen. But even that, even knowing that you have the same queen for a whole year and testing those mite levels a few times to make sure that they stay low, even that's a lot of work mm -hmm. in an operation where you're breeding queens. That's even beyond what many people could do. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Oh, ask, ask, how do you know they're varroa resistant? Yeah. Yeah, it's a good question. Danielle, and I, go ahead. I'm sorry, Daniel. Earlier, you had mentioned about kind of doing research with supplements for yeah. bees. Do you have any re suggestion for us non-commercial beekeepers? Um, well, I think if you have the ability to make a supplement at, and you're not doing it at scale, where you've got it you know, in big tanker size loads, um, bees really like pollen. And I think if you can get some pollen in there, it's much better for them. Uh, if you collect your own pollen and keep it in the freezer, you can make a supplement with pollen that you know you're not accidentally introducing something. So if you're, depending on the scale you're working at, if you know you need supplements, you can collect a little pollen and make them. Um, and I think that that study is gonna start the pandemic set it back a little bit, but but it will actually compare the commercial products, not only for price, but also for the, the benefits that the bees saw. And so I would watch for that study and it should do some um, informing about which supplements are a good value for beekeepers at any scale, so. What's your opinion of probiotics or DFM? Uh, well, I think, the, you know, it's an interesting idea, but I have not seen data that's convincing about probiotics. So I think it's, this is why we're doing the study with supplements and, and we would like to do one with probiotic products as well. Pam actually supports a lot of research on probiotic um, studies to have that data. Um, but I don't, I don't think there's been a product that has shown definitively that there's a lot of benefits to the bees. So, you know, that's, I take a vitamin too, and I can't tell you that I have a benefit every day of taking a vitamin, but I still do it. So I'm, I don't, I don't mean to say that you don't do it, but I haven't seen data that would, that I could give you a clear answer about that. Thank you. Danielle, I had another question regarding how you're working on all the other projects. Is there just nothing on a predator for Varroa? 
Uh, they've done some work on that, like with pseudoscorpions and um, some, I, if, if you email me, I can send you some of that stuff, but it's, it's really hard because you're trying to control a mite on a bee and bees are so good at cleaning things out. So it's hard to imagine something that could scoot around and eat Varroa that the bees aren't going to detect and chuck out. Mm. So there've been, there've been studies to look for like a, a fungal spore that will affect the Varroa um, because then the bees can't clean all of that out. There's work like um, Stamets work on mycelium. They're trying, to, they're trying to cultivate mycelium that will feed on the Varroa. And that would be something that is harder for the bees to completely remove. But if you've seen bees cleaning, like chasing around um, small high beetles or wax moths, it's hard to imagine that you could build something up at a level that could, could make a dent in Varroa. And in fact, that's what we've seen. Like you can find something that will eat a Varroa, but whether it can uh, outsmart the bees to get to the Varroa, uh, that that hasn't happened. It is a classic entomology approach, though, is to find a, a biocontrol or a predator in insect systems. But bees are just so good. What about? I'm just thinking. What about another food source for the varroa? Like, if we as beekeepers could find some kind of other, like gel or something, we put in the hive, and they would rather go after that food source rather than the um, larva food source. Yes, yeah, so that is semiochemistry. So looking at the chemical ecology of what attracts, like why does Varroa choose preferentially a drone cell? Is it a smell? Can we manipulate that and trap them into something else? And there have been studies that get us some knowledge, but nothing that has led to a product or, um, or a delivery system. Uh, again, the, I the idea from, finding the science and into the translation of like an actual um, application in beehives often is where it breaks down because the bees clean things out, they propolize things up. Uh, so you've got a lot of signals in there competing um, and it's a sensitive system. So it's, it's hard to hack it. Hmm. Hmm. Wanna hear my, my wish? Yes. Okay. So. Uh, wouldn't it be wonderful if the state of California could be completely flooded, say with pole line, so we could reduce uh, having to, to rely on rural mite treatments of all kinds. And it would somehow, I don't even know if this is possible, but it would push out the, the overly defensive genetics that we find uh, specifically in, in Southern California. And we would be able to keep bees that are more docile, more gentle, require less uh, intervention because they're take, managing their own, their own pests. Is, is that realistic of me to think? <laughs> it's a very realistic wish, but mm -hmm. um, I can't help you with getting beekeepers to agree. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, you know, just like the, the idea that if we all sample at the same time and we all treat at the same time, that would be kind of a, 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 an approach that could give us big footprints of control and understanding and knowledge. But you know, as well as I do, how, how difficult it is to get people to, to do things like that. So I, I think it's a great idea and you can start that in small um, neighborhoods, but uh, it's very challenging, and especially with so much itinerant beekeeping. You're right. not going to, you know, what they do while they're in one location really is going to have a big impact on their whole system. But, um, but they're not there very long. So, yeah, it's, hard. it's like herding cats. Yeah, yeah, herding cats for sure. Well, you never know. The camp is growing, and uh, perhaps we can set something up that eventually there will be a. Uh, my testing day, you know, throughout the entire state of California, where all of this info can be reported and really leveraged to the benefit of, of science. Yeah, yeah I, hope, I hope you're right. I think 
um, we learn the hard way and uh, I don't want to wish for this, but right now we have a tool that works to control Varroa. And should that, if that failed, it would really force a lot of change and that, that could happen. I don't want it to happen, but I think that's probably what would really push people into looking for new ways. Cause as long as they can do what's predictable and it's still mostly working, mm -hmm. humans have a tendency to just do that. And that, you know, that makes sense. You don't want to create extra work, but we can see that we're building a system that could really drop off a ledge quickly. And so having backup plans and other tools in our toolbox would be wise. Agreed. Well, any other questions before we say good evening to our speaker this evening? Oh, well, looks like we're good. And we're at 8.03. Um, we're very, very grateful that you were able to take the time out of your schedule to be with us this evening, Danielle. Uh, we certainly all learned a lot. And uh, we know where to find Project Ava's M if we would like to perhaps press a donate button uh, as a result of having viewed the um, you know, indoor overwintering PDF or something like yep. that. So all, all of this work, it happens on donations and we're very grateful. So thank you. Yeah. It was, uh, good to see you, Wendy. And yeah. nice to talk to your group. Yes, great seeing you too. Be well, take good you care too. everybody. Bye now. Bye.